I would love to talk to Gabby and Kay about this next question. Uh, modern sapphic fiction has started to include positive representation of bi, pan, and queer women who love women, but don't necessarily identify as lesbian. In the past, uh, I'm sad to say such uh, identities were often treated as tainted or made the butt of jokes in the dialogue of lesbian characters. Uh, have you noticed a values shift in sapphic fiction toward uh, support of these identities? And how is this manifested uh, in your own work? Let's start with Gabby. You haven't spoken in a bit. And then I want to jump to Kay. Um, yeah, I have noticed a difference, definitely. Um, and it's for me it's awesome uh, i'm bisexual and i also i love the word pan for both of them, both of them for me are fantastic and fit me to a t um but and coming to that was a journey as for everybody and their identity probably it may evolve again who knows you everything is changing all the time but um for for my own books i'm i guess i'm constantly trying to include what's in my life and i have a huge queer group i have friends who are non-binary i have uh, lesbians in my life, bisexuals, I have trans mask people and it's just I think seeing more and more of that within sapphic fiction or lesfic is has been really really cool to see and it's just including it is a way of I think what everyone has already said is reflecting pieces of your own life and wanting to see it yourself and it's interesting because most of the time you tend to get reviews saying that it's great to see these people but Sometimes I still have had an odd review or even an email that um, like it feels like it was too much queer. Like there were too many queer characters in the book because their friends are queer or they, you know, you've got someone who is non-binary and someone who is pan and someone who is bi and that's like a, a quilt and it's too much and you, you don't get that in life. And I was just so thrown off when I got that email because that's my life. And I was like, is that not representative? And so it's interesting. We're, we're flamingos, we flock together. It's like, yeah, it's weird 100... if you don't have queer friends. Like, what are you doing? I, I know it's like on TV, there, there's like the one lesbian and then maybe they get a girlfriend and then they have no other queer people in their life. And I'm just not everyone to I can't live that way. Surrounded by queer people and we have like the one token straight friend. Right? Yes, <laughs> that is, that, that's it. Uh, Kay, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic as well about the inclusion of other identities besides just lesbians. Um, well, I think I, I may be coming from a place of, of privilege with this because, you know, when I went to a, a, a magnet school for the arts, uh, it, I was surrounded by bisexual people and uh, there were... You're welcome. That was part, that was just always part of it for me, as far as I knew. And so when I started running into people who had had run-ins with people saying that bisexuals didn't count, I was very confused. And I have the privilege of, of still being very confused about that. Um, and the the dissenting voices are sort of a very, very distant background. And I, I guess my hope for the genre going forward is that everyone uh, gets to, to live on that lovely island with me where uh, the everyone else is, is who's saying that bisexuals, pansexuals, other queer folk don't belong. It's sort of a, a distant echo on the breeze. In recent years, we've seen a push toward and then an abrupt pull away from the term own voices to describe work by marginalized authors. As someone uh, who has seen this trend on social media, I'm curious, uh, what do you think of this shift? Um, I think that uh, as with many things uh, on social media, it was an excellent idea that occurred for a reason and then that reason got lost in the sort of thin slicing of, it, these things can get very messy if you try to dig down into the details and apply a rule to everything exactly. Uh, the theory that we as, as a, a literary world need authentic stories uh, and that we need to make space for authors who have a variety of experiences to tell their authentic stories is extremely important and readers should be able to know uh, when they pick up a book that what they're going to read isn't going to be BS, uh, <laughs> that, that the, the book is going to know what it's talking about. Uh, I think Own Voices was a good start on that, but it also gets really complicated because, you know, what does it mean exactly? Like, am I, am I 
is it only own voices if I write non-binary lesbians with fibro and ADHD? Is, is it that specific or how, how, much, how much can we take for granted uh, that because we have a peripheral touch to it culturally that, that we have some inference about it? Uh, I think taking a look at instead of own voices, focusing on a variety of editors, a variety of stories, a variety of sensitivity readers, uh, and really making every story, whether it's own voices or not, as genuine and have as many hands on it to make sure that it is genuine as possible. Cindy, do you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we're just in a very dynamic time where, um, you know, it's that old sort of thesis, antithesis, synthesis kind of idea where something gets put out there and there's some agreement to it. And then somebody has a counter argument or has, feels like they're being pushed into a corner from that original thesis. And so we have to come to some middle place that makes sense, that takes the original idea, for the good that was embedded in the original idea. I mean, I'm just repeating what Kay said uh, and, and who said it much more clearly than I did. But I do think that that's true, that we have to find the middle ground between not really um, dissing authors or, or discounting authors who are trying to write a variety of characters while also making sure that we have room for authentic uh, lives of people who haven't been heard from. We just have to find that middle ground. And, and like so much about identity and the words we use and everything, everything is in so much flux. And I, I think in the, on the whole, it's a good thing. It's just a lot of change and we just have to be very much working through that. Uh, so, um, you know, I think there were some good things about own voices and there were some great critiques about it. And we have to get to a place where it all makes sense to as many people as we can. Yeah, uh, I saw Elena raise a finger. Uh, do you have something to say about this topic? I'm eager to hear your thoughts. I, it really is more of a, I'm an old person that doesn't spend any time online. And so um, this you. language isn't uh, part of my lexicon. And I wonder if it overlaps with the question in our Q&A uh, from an intersectional perspective, what are some of the underrepresented identities that you would like to see explored in queer lit? That was exactly the next question. And I was gonna go to you and Hannah with that. <laughs> so would you like to talk about some of the underrepresented identities in sapphic fiction? Well, I really, my question was how we, going back to what Kay was talking about, do we as privileged writers uh, work to include that diversity? Um, and Kay, I love your point of making sure uh, that that representation is, it rings true, but how do we encourage this? Goes back a little bit to my book, who are the people who can shuttle through the voices and make sure that those voices are told, that those voices get the platform and tell their own stories. So that was kind of my musings 